So this is the second Casalegno Lectures of 2018. And the title of the lecture is From Epistemic Functions to Epistemic Permissions. Thank you. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about a structural uh, issue with, with norms of uh, belief. One that arises in similar forms um, irrespective of what particular kind of standard uh, you think that belief uh, should be uh, held to. And so I'll, I'll just I'll briefly explain uh, what the uh, issue uh, is. It may seem like a slightly uh, technical uh, one, but I think there's been, it, there's been a, a quite a lot of confusion in the discussion uh, because uh, people haven't appreciated uh, the, w this aspect of what's going uh, on. And I, I think as where people have in some way been misled by um, aspects of the, the problem which, which should not be creating the, the real difficulties. Um, so I, I'm taking it that it, it's a pretty plausible view about norms of belief that in, in some very broad sense they are um, functional in uh, nature, that, that they involve in the first instance some kind of classification of uh, beliefs into um, the defective ones and the, the non-defective uh, ones, as if you like, um, roughly speaking, bad beliefs and good beliefs. Um, and, and so this initial classification is one that only arises when there actually is a belief there, somebody believes something, in order for the belief to be classified uh, in one way uh, or the or the other. And in this respect, I think it's quite uh, similar to the, uh, the case of um, the norm of keeping your promises, uh, even though, of course, in other respects that involves sort of considerations of the an agent's responsibility and so on, which I was suggesting last time, are not so central to um, epistemological questions. But in this particular respect, I think there is an analogy. Um, because um, it, with, a, with a promise, there's, there's, the obligation is created by the act of making the promise. So, I mean, you might, maybe you have some general obligation to keep your promises, as it were, an impersonal obligation. But when you make a promise, you, you thereby uh, undertake an obligation to the promisee. I think on the handout it says to the promise, but that's a misprint. But, but you're, making a, 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 an, you're undertaking an obligation to the person to whom you made the promise. By the way, there's a handout for those who just come in. Um, to, to do whatever it is that you promised to do. And so um, in a, a world where you, d you don't make the promise, there just is no obligation. And so the, n n there's no, no question of... Um, <laughs> What, as it were, what you ought or may, may do in relation to the obligation. So I, I'm suggesting that in the case of beliefs, the, the initial classification is in that respect similar, that it's, it's, as it were, we've got to have a belief in, in order to classify it. But it's also the case that in discussion of the norms of belief, we typically take these norms to be, in a general sense, modal uh, in nature. And, um, and I mean, that's kind of avert in the, for example, when we talk about permissible, I mean, the ible there is a, is a kind of signal of, of something uh, modal going on. And, um, and then we, and, and we can think of um, obligation and permission as corresponding to uh, modal uh, operators um, 
and you know which which are dual in the the usual way that that uh, it ought it ought to be that p if and only or you ought to to do something if and only if it's not the case that uh, you're permitted uh, not to do it and and vice versa um, and. Uh, p, the uppercase P for permission. Uh, um, and the thing about these, these deontic uh, modalities is, is that they make sense in any situation, it seems, where, so that we can, we can talk about whether you, you're permitted or obliged to believe something, even in a world in which you don't uh, believe that thing. Um, and, and so there's a kind of extension of these normative notions from the initial one which which only classifies beliefs as it were in situations where that somebody actually has them to a, um, a classification of um, what it's permissible to believe which applies it, even when nobody uh, has the the, the belief um, and, as I said, the, the, the discussion of these issues in recent years has tended uh, to focus on these modal notions. And I, I think that there's really um, a, a, a non-trivial problem about how exactly we, we get from the initial classification to the, 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 the final modal classification. Um, I, I mean, it may not be a problem that has to do with the, the roots of uh, these uh, normative uh, statuses. But it's, it's a problem that arises for the ordinary ways of thinking about them. And, and so we, we need to understand uh, what's going on. And I think what's going on is, uh, is a, a little bit subtler than, than one might realize. Um, so that's, that's the, the problem that I'm going to be uh, addressing. Uh, today, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to start with the assumption that w that we can classify um, beliefs as defective or non-defective, and I'm going to be very neutral in most of the discussion about uh, what counts as a defective uh, belief or what counts as a non-defective one. So I, I, I mean, I've m mentioned three kinds of norms that we could be talking about. It could be that a non-defective belief is a true belief, or it could be that it's uh, a belief w w which is suitably based on um, evidence, or it it could be a belief which constitutes uh, knowledge. Uh, and I'm I'm just uh, going to, as I say, be mainly neutral on the question of what the the substance uh, of the the, the uh, this initial classification, uh, this initial norm uh, is, and focus on the matter of form. Um, one. Subtlety, which it, it, I don't want to make a big deal of, but it's worth n noting that it arises, is that it, it seems uh, possible that a given agent at a given time should have um, more than one belief with the very same propositional uh, content, um, and I mean one way that that could arise is in Frege puzzle cases, where, uh, for example, the the names Hesperus and Phosphorus d d d refer to the very same object, but that's not transparent to the agent. And then um, I mean, so the agent um, they might have b both a, w a belief that they would expressed by saying um, that Hesperus appears in the evening and uh, a second belief that they, um, they might express by saying that phosphorus uh, appears in the evening. And those beliefs could be differently formed. Right? Uh, I mean, or, or I mean, it could be, it could be for example, that the, the, w w one of them is based on observation, and the and the second um, is in is inferred from the first. 
you know, well, maybe they, maybe they have a belief that, you know, so it could be that, as it were, the first is some phi of uh, Hesperus, and then they, they have a belief that Hesperus equals phosphorus, and then they infer from that that, 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 that phosphorus also has this um, feature. And uh, in, in principle, it could be that the second, the second belief has a different normative status from the first, because, for example, it could be that, that they, um, they, their belief uh, that they would express say, with, uh, saying Hesperus is phosphorus, I mean, that could be um, very badly based. It could be based on, on some complete miscalculation in astronomy that just happened to get the right answer. And, and so, in principle, it could be that the, the first of these beliefs uh, is non-defective, and the second is defective, even though if you accept something like a, um, a direct reference uh, view of content, then the, the actual proposition expressed by these two sentences would be the same. Um, and there might also be examples that don't depend on, uh, on direct reference, but where, where the... I mean, even if it was the, the same Fragian thought or something, if you thought, if you uh, understood propositions that way, it could be that, you know, in cases where um, we have, a, to some extent, a divided mind, not necessarily very radically divided, but, but we're often not very good at totally integrating uh, all our um, propositional attitudes. I, I mean, it could be that you have one uh, good um, belief in a given Fragian thought and, an, and another belief based on uh, on some much less respectable kind of reasoning in the very same Frakian thought. I mean, it w um, I mean, it might not be terribly rational, but uh, but but you might you might have that. So so uh, as it were, one one little complication that we're going to to need to take care of is the fact that uh, you that you may have more than one belief in the same uh, proposition at the same time, and that those. Uh, beliefs may differ from each other in normative uh, status. Okay, so um, uh, well, I think what, I, what I'm going to, to do is to, as it were, explain the kind of uh, construction th that I have in mind for, uh, for getting from this defective, non-defective uh, belief classification to the modal classification. Um, and um, I won't say very much in, in initially presenting the, uh, the construction uh, to motivate it, and, but I'll, I'll say things in retrospect to, to explain why I've done things um, the, the way that I have. And w one thing I'm going to I'm going to use is I'm going to use a some modal notions which I'll express in the usual way by a diamond for possibility and a box for uh, necessity, um, and these these are not deontic, right? These these, these are just understood as um, involving some kind of um, well, if, if the formal semantics would involve some kind of, of uh, quantification over uh, worlds, but just the, as it were, which, the worlds which will be, be relevant in some way, and so it will not be typically be quantification over all possible uh, worlds, um, but but just over some as it were locally accessible ones. So this this might be uh, the kind of modality that would correspond to. Uh, talk in ordinary uh, language about what someone can do. You know, in a sense, for example, I, c I, can, um, I can reach uh, the window, but I can't reach the ceiling, that kind of thing. Um, and and one, one principle uh, that I will assume is that um, the, the corresponds to the, the T axiom, which is that if some, whatever is the, is the case is possible. Uh, I, won't assume, I won't assume anything more, more than, uh, th than that uh, um, about the, anything like iterations of, of this uh, modal operator.
but I'll, 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 I will, that, that will be relevant. Um, and, and so now we've, so we've got, we've got some kind of modal notion, but we, what we want is the deontic notion that will allow us to talk about um, when somebody is permitted or obliged to believe a given uh, proposition. And I'm going to define an auxiliary notion here, um, which is, I've, I've put as S, that S is a subject, a person. Uh, S is okay with P. So a person is okay with a given proposition. And, um, and this is def defined as a, just as a material conditional, that if S has a belief in P, then S has a non-defective uh, belief in P. Um, so th there are basically two ways of being okay with a proposition. Um, what one way you can be okay with a proposition is just by having no belief in it at all. The other way that you can be okay with it is by having a non-defective belief in the proposition. Okay. N notice, by the way, that someone who has one defective belief and one non-defective uh, belief um, in a proposition counts as okay uh, with respect to that proposition. Um, so, it, as it were, roughly speaking, the way I'm setting things up, the, your, your non-defective belief kind of redeems the, the defective uh, one. And, uh, I mean, this is... You, you could consider what, how things would go if you, if, you, if, you did it, if you did it somewhat differently, where you required, roughly speaking, that the person has no non-defective belief. But, I think, but I, I think the way I'm doing it, things go a little bit more smoothly. It, it's, not, it's not a very big deal, but it, it's worth noticing that a decision is being made about this. Um, yes? You mean because they don't have a belief? Right, because if they think that you cannot finish it, whether it's P yes. or not P. I mean, but The way I'm doing things, yes, because, I mean, the, the, of course, their belief that it's an open issue is, you know, that's a, fal that's a, false, be a, a false belief. That's, so they're not okay with the proposition that, that, that it's an open issue, whether P, but they're, uh, but they're okay just with respect to P itself. And, and so, the, so this is, I'm keeping this very, very, very narrow. So, I mean, ev even, um, you know, in the case where um, you, you have a, a false belief in not P. <laughs> the, the, um, that you can still be okay with respect to, to P here. Um, so, we, I mean, we can come, we can we can come back to this this issue later. But but I mean, if you, if you bear with me and see, and see how the construction goes, and then you'll see what the what the consequences of doing things the way I'm I'm doing them, and I'll and I'll and I'll explain a little bit about um, why I'm keeping things quite local. Um, but but d d definitely, you know, one that there are alternative constructions that one, that one can consider, and and so that um, I'm I, you know I'm not suggesting that that this is the only conceivable way of of doing things. But but for the time being, that that's how I how I am uh, doing it. Um, so, what, what I'm going to, to do is, is define um, some very local modalities um, by combining this idea of, being, of an agent being okay with respect to a proposition with 
the, uh, the non-deontic um, uh, modalities that, that we started with. And, and so basically, uh, all, all the way I'm doing that is simply by um, restricting the, these non-deontic uh, modalities by um, the, <laughs> the condition that S is okay with P. So I'm relativizing them to, um, to a given subject and a given agent. So I've got the, the may um, with respect to S, P, and well, I put, written it, should um, S, P. So, so for each pair of an agent and a proposition, there, there are these dual deontic notions. Um, and, uh, and there, uh, as I've uh, defined them on near the bottom of the first page of the, of the handout, so Q is just any old proposition. I mean, because we want this to be a general definition of, of a modality. Um, and, and so, that, as it were, S may, oops, sorry, let me, S may um, be such that, uh, with respect to P, such that uh, Q, if uh, it's possible that S is okay with P and Q is the case. So, in other words, there's some uh, locally possible world in which S is okay with P and Q holds, and dually for should, that um, in what that comes to is that um, in all these locally possible worlds, if S is okay with P, then Q is the case. And, and then now, now we want to uh, define the things that we're really interested in, which are the notions of that S may believe P and S should believe P. So, so th we're doing that just by plugging in S believes P, which I've written B S P for, the, for Q in those modalities. Um, so that um, S may believe P. What it, what it comes to is, um, in effect, that it's possible for S to be okay with P and to believe P. And, of course, what that conjunction implies is that S has a non-defective belief in P because uh, the, the, the second conjunct tells you that S has a belief in P and then S being okay with P tells you that if S has a belief in P, then S has a non-defective belief in P. Um, and, and conversely, if, if S has a non-defective belief in P, um, then S is okay with P, but also S has a, def has a belief in P and therefore BSP holds. So that S, as well, when you work through the implications of these definitions, S may believe that P is just saying that it's locally possible that S has a non-defective uh, belief in P. Um, and uh, saying that S should believe that P, this is, this is uh, at first sight it's a bit less intuitive, but on reflection it works out as it should. That's saying that necessarily, I mean in all these local worlds where S is okay with P, then S believes P. And, and so that comes out as um, equivalent to just in all these local worlds S has a belief in P. Um, and <laughs> The reason that those two are equivalent is that in any world where S does not have a belief in P, then it, by the definition of being okay with, it, it follows that S is okay with, with P. Um, and, and so if it's, um, if it's necessarily the case that if S is okay with P, then 
S believes P, then it follows that S believes P. So that, as it were, it's, it's, it's going to be impossible if, if, it's, if necessarily um, S is okay with P implies BSP, then it's just impossible for S uh, to lack a, uh, a belief uh, in P. And so um, we, this actually requires that, that in all these locally possible worlds, S has a belief in P. And conversely, um, if um, in all, all these local, locally possible worlds, S has a belief in P, then that conditional um, holds a fortiori. Um, so so it, it, it's kind of working the way it, it should do. And, um, and one uh, consequence that we'd certainly want, um, and th this is partly why I did the, the things with the case of multiple beliefs in the same uh, proposition the, the way I did. Um, w one consequence we get from this is, is that if, if S has a non-defective belief in P, um, then it follows that S may believe P. So as, it, so as well, they, in the case where you do have the belief, these things go together as they, uh, as they should. And that's because if S has a non-defective belief in P, then it's possible for S to have a non-defective belief in P by this T axiom. And, uh, and that's w what we saw was equivalent to the, um, being the case that S may believe P. Um, so, I'll, I'll just say something about why I've done things in this uh, local way. Um, and, and then maybe we can pause for um, a, a bit of questioning discussion, uh, because it, it, it's, this, it may not be completely transparent how, how this is working. So, what you might be thinking is, well, why bother with all this rel relativization of these um, deont deontic modalities to a particular agent and uh, a particular proposition? But the thing is, what, what, we, what we need is uh, some kind of uh, restriction on uh, on the worlds, we need to. We're going to need to restrict these these non-deontic operators by some kind of condition that says that that we're in a a good world uh, with respect to belief. Um, and if if we well, if we didn't relativize this to the uh, agent, uh, things would go wrong um, because it seems that that you can have a, a, a perfectly uh, good uh, belief that someone else has a false belief. Right? I, mean, you, you can, you, you, I mean, you can have a, you know, a, a correct belief that Donald Trump falsely believes that he's the greatest president ever or something. Um, and, but if, if we weren't relativizing it to the agent, then um, any world uh, in, in which uh, we uh, violate, sorry, in, any world in which uh, things are good with respect to belief in general will be one um, in which, well, if, it's, if we try to have, a, as it were, a world where all, all beliefs by all agents are true, um, you won't be able to believe that someone else has a false belief in that world because if you ha if your belief is true, then their belief is false. So one or other of you has a has a false uh, belief, um, and so it seems that um, that we need to to relativize it to the particular uh, agent but, um, in in order to to get the the right uh, evaluations. And in fact, we need to localize it much more than that um, because it seems that y you can have a perfectly good belief that you have false beliefs, that some of your beliefs are false. Um, I mean, in fact, it seems that in some case, you know, may, might even be that that all of us know that we have false beliefs. Um, I mean, of course, we don't know 
presumably, e exactly which of our beliefs are false, because let's hope that if we did know that, we would do something about it. Um, but, but often we can know that we have false beliefs. So, I mean, for example, you know, in the case of uh, philosophical paradoxes, um, our, our beliefs um, lead to uh, contradictions in the, let's say, you know, concerning the, the liar and other semantic paradoxes or paradoxes of vagueness or whatever are your favorite paradoxes. And so some, sometimes that we know that, that not all our beliefs can be true because they're inconsistent with each other, but we don't, we don't know which ones to abandon. And, uh, and so in cases like that, we, we may even know that we, that we have some false beliefs. And, and so if we're, um, if we're going to give the right normative status to the belief that, that we have uh, false beliefs, um, we, we can't do things just by saying, well, let's, let's look at all the worlds uh, where your, um, your beliefs are, um, are, are all true, because th there won't be any of those worlds in which uh, you have the belief that you have false beliefs, right? Because that belief, if you have that belief, then you have a false uh, belief. It's guaranteed because either that belief is false or, or some other belief that you have is, or if it's true. Yes? Yes. Would this uh, entail that still you believe that he and not he or not? Well, so of course the, there may be cases where uh, on, on once you actually reach the proposition, you know, a contradiction, that you, you might well suspend belief on P itself. But I'm taking it that there are cases where uh, as with the liar paradox, where there are a bunch of sort of general principles that we accept, uh, all of which seem compelling, and and then somehow, and also some maybe some um, some observations, you know, w w like that, that Epimenides said that uh, he's not speaking truly, or something like that, which does seem like you know, I mean, easily verifiable, and. Um, and so altogether, this, this bundle of uh, general principles and uh, observations leads to a contradiction. And so, I mean, you know, let's say that the, that the liar sentence is true and the liar sentence is not true or something like that. So we, maybe we will suspend belief on whether the liar sentence is true. But, it, but in many of these cases, we don't want to suspend belief on the things that have led us to the, this result because they, each of them individually seem so compelling. But then in this, in this case, you would not believe P and not P. You wouldn't, you wouldn't, in, in that case, you wouldn't believe P and not P, but you would still, but you would still have inconsistent beliefs. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And by the way, uh, um, I, I think it may be, it may be, I mean, it may be possible to, um, to, to directly have contradictory beliefs in, in the sense of, let's say, believing... Well, so th there are a bunch of uh, cases, but cases where p somebody both believes P and believes not P, or maybe believes P and not P. So one, one example would be dialetheists, such as Graham Priest. Because, you know, I, I mean, Graham, Graham Priest, will, he will certainly say that the the Russell set is a member of itself and it's not a member of itself. And, you know, I think he's entirely sincere when he says that. And I think he probably does believe, <laughs> believe that. So I think, and, and, I, and I don't think that he's using any of the expressions in a non-standard sense. So, so I think Graham, Graham Priest is an example. Um, there may also be, as it were, examples not involving 
um, philosophical theorizing. Um, so that, for example, you know, the, the case of the of self-deception, where um, it, sometimes self-deception seems to involve um, a kind of divided mind where, you know, part of you knows something, but the other part of it is in denial, like, you know, the, the, the um, <laughs> You know, the case of the you know the mother whose whose son was on a on a ship that was wrecked and 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 at one level she knows that he's he's dead but but there's part of her that you know that that um, you know think believes that he he must have survived and that one day he's coming home and she better keep his room ready for him and all those kind of things so that that might be a case where on the one hand she knows that he's dead and so believes that he's dead on the other hand she also seems to have this belief that he's not Dead. And um, and I remember actually once uh, at a conference, Elizabeth Anscom um, talking about about someone she'd known who who had you know going by her description, uh, which I'm kind of willing to believe. She she knew somebody who who I don't know. I'm not sure what ex what the proposition was, but. But he, he both believed P and believed not P and was very aware of the contradiction and was totally agonized by it. And you know, he, uh, that, you know, he, he, he wanted you know, at all costs not, not to be in this situation of, of Borea, but he just could not get rid of either of the beliefs. And you know, I, I think that, I mean, human beings are complicated enough that, that you know, I, I think it's po it is possible to, to have cases like that. Um, I mean, and, and it could be, I mean, it could also be that, you know, maybe, you know, I mean, imagine a case where, where there's a, a completely reliable oracle and, um, and you, you know, go to the oracle and you ask the oracle, do, uh, do I have any false beliefs? And the oracle tells you yes, <laughs> um, and but, but with it, well, it doesn't give you any further information ab about about which the, which they are. I mean, that, that that seems like a case where you know, or at least have very good reason to believe that you have. Well, in fact, once you have the belief that you have false beliefs, that then uh, that guarantees that you do have uh, false beliefs. So, so I think these the, the, these are cases which really can can arise. Um, I mean, I think there may be also uh, the, the w w ones which uh, arise not for purely logical reasons, but partly just in terms of um, what the local uh, connections are. Um, so, so I think, I mean, what we need to do is to, to set things up in such a way that we can differentiate it, the, the, the status of different beliefs that a person uh, has. And um, that's, I mean, some of them are defective and some of them are, are non-defective. And if we, if we just look at you know, the worlds where the person has the belief and w whether their beliefs in general are okay in that world, we're not being discriminating enough. And so that as we're, in order to make the, the discriminations we want, I think we have to uh, relativize these things in, in the way that I've suggested. And um, again, I think there's a, an analogy with uh, promising. Um, because, I mean, uh, you know, you can imagine a case where um, someone, let's say, uh, let's say a man with two lovers and he makes a promise to one lover to, to break his, his promise to the second lover. Um, and, and then, you know, if we just go to consider all the worlds in which he keeps all his promises, well, I mean, the, you know, there are no, given the promises that he's made, I mean, there are no worlds where he keeps his promise. Uh, uh, but all his promises, because he can only keep the, the promise to break a promise by breaking an, another promise. But, but it, it's still the case that, that, that we can give a fine-grained description of what his obligations are, right? Because um, his, his, he's got an on the one hand, he's got an obligation 
to the, the, the first lover to break his promise to the second lover, and on the other hand, he's got an obligation to the second lover to keep his promise to her. So, um, and, we, and so we want to be able to distinguish the, the cases where he's violated one obligation from the cases where he's violated the other obligation. Um, and, uh, and so, so there we, we, again, we have to do things in this kind of uh, local way. Um, and because as it were, when, when we're going from the, these original defective versus non-defective classifications to the modal classifications, um, we, ha we have to be careful that, that we don't, as it were, lose too much information in, uh, in going modal. And, and so I think that that motivates uh, keeping things uh, local in the way that I've suggested. Okay, let, let me just stop there and, and uh, we can have a bit of time for questions. Just, um, I mean, if you, just to make sure that, 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 that this, the, the kind of apparatus that I've suggested is, is, is clear. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Uh, you say that you have to keep things locally to understand the nature of the promise, but then can you explain a little bit more uh, what means to keep things uh, locally? Well, yeah, so but what I mean by keeping them l l local is that um, the that we can't, in, in order to make sense of the situation, we can't just talk about what he's obliged to do given the promises he's made by the general norm of promise keeping. Because the general norm of promise, so the, because what he's obliged to do, that would have, um, according to the general norm of promise keeping, is to is to keep all his promises. So you know, and and then given the nature of the promises that he's made, it is it's simply impossible to um, for him to keep all his promises. And uh, and so um, you know, if if we if we're just considering what's the case in all possible worlds where he's made these promises and keeps all of them, then there are no such possible worlds. And so, well, strictly speaking, as it were, he'd, everything would be obligatory. And, um, but, um, but we've got to that unsatisfactory conclusion by, by being too coarse-grained and, and not discriminating between the, his, uh, his obligations to one lover from his obligations to the other lover. And, um, and so it, if we... And perhaps even the obligations created by, by one promise, you know, as, a, as opposed to another promise. And so it, w what we need to do is, when we're thinking about the obligations created by a given promise, um, as simply to consider all, all the worlds in which he keeps that promise. Um, and they may be, they may be worlds which involve, well, in, in this case, they, they, they are worlds in, in which um, he violates another promise. But, but as we're, we, we, we want to be able to evaluate these, these things promise by promise uh, uh, in, order, in order to understand the different obligations that the individual promises uh, create. Um, and, and in this case, the, the main thing is just his obligations towards one lover versus his obligations to, to the other. And, uh, and so uh, this ki the kind of relativization that I'm suggesting is, is working like that in a similar way for, for belief. Yeah, yeah, if you can say just a bit more about how we determine the, uh, you know, the context of, uh, in, in yes. which we have to decide the words, just because I'm thinking, I, I want to see how much you're construing there is, say, metaphysically substantial in those words. In the sense, what I imagine is, okay, you, uh, you can believe something, but then maybe the objects in those other words may be so different than the objects in these words 
that uh, um, you know the, the beliefs don't have an exact correspondence. So what I, what I'm thinking is about is uh, uh, really how liberal we should be, basically with respect to the metaphysics of uh, of the other words. That's that's an example. I see. There so might be more. So this, this is mainly a question about, in effect, the metaphysics of propositions and, yeah. and beliefs. It's, so I, I haven't said very much about, uh, about that. Um, so, I mean, my, my own sympathies, I guess, are on the whole with relatively coarse-grained uh, propositions, uh, maybe even Stallmaker-like sets of possible worlds, something like that, so that, um, that so that you can have the same proposition as presented by many different guises or sentences or, or whatever. Um, but I mean, th th it may well be that if the objects are so different, if you mean that the objects that it's a belief about don't. Uh, uh, you know, are not present in the in the other world. I mean, there's at least, um, well, on my view, that they're not concrete or something. But, um, then it it might be it might be in in practice impossible for somebody to have the same belief in another another world. So that that uh, that's one of the ways that um, the that the the, the possible worlds in which you have this belief are constrained, you know, I mean, by what it's possible to believe. But maybe, actually, I, I might make one more clarificatory remark, which about, about the range of possibility here that, that leads on to. Um, so I'm thinking that these, the, the, the modalities are uh, set by context, so that it's, depending on the context, the, the, the relevant possible worlds may, may differ. Um, and um, and that's, uh, that's because um, we get those kind of de deontic um, af effects in all sorts of cases. But, um, so for example, you know, t I mean, take my, my w watch here, then, um, you know, it, it, you're, you're not permitted to, it's not permissible for you to take my watch and, and, and leave the room with it, right? Um, I mean, that's, that's, you know, not morally or, or legally uh, permissible for you just to walk off with my watch. But w when I say that, of course, th there's a, an implicit restriction in which worlds are being considered, because after all, there are possible worlds in which I give you this watch. And, you know, and then it's yours, and of course you can uh, walk off with it. Um, and, and so I was, when I said that it's permissible, uh, it's not permissible for you to, to walk off with that watch, I was just excluding those words as, words as irrelevant. I was just taking it for granted that, that my ownership of the watch is held fixed. But, um, but you know, we can change the context by saying something like, well, of course it's permissible for you to um, accept this watch as a gift from me and walk off with it, um, leave the room with it. And of course, if it's you know, in the sense in which it's permissible for you to accept the watch as a gift and walk off with it, then of course it follows that it's, also, it's permissible for you to walk off with it, right? Because it, you know, it, accepting it as a gift and walking off with it entails uh, walking off with it. And so um, you know, just, by, by, just by saying um, that it's permissible, I mean, in, for you to accept it as a gift and walk off with it, I've, you know, I've changed the context by in introducing worlds uh, in which the, the ownership of the watch changes um, as, as contextually relevant uh, you know, by specifically raising that, that possibility. Um, and, uh, and so that th th what we're going to say about what's permissible de depends on these kind of contextual uh, factors. Um, and I mean, that's, that's not at all uh, surprising, but it's, it, it's, going to, it's going to mean that 
that the interpretation of the box and the diamond will will vary according to contextual factors. You know, in, in that I mean, which is I mean, it, I know that wasn't exactly what you were asking about, but it, it seemed like a, a good mo moment to, to to mention that as. So when you define, I sh should believe that P, should believe P in terms of should SP, BSP, uh, you are, that's supposed to be not just a stipulative, stipulative definition, it's supposed to reconstruct what the meaning of I should uh, believe that P is. These, these uh, are uh, yes. I mean, these let, are. Uh, um, let me put the question in another in another way. I mean, um, it seems that you. Do, I mean, suppose that I have a, um, uh, a euro. I believe that I have a euro in my pocket because yesterday I remember that putting a euro in my pocket. But then I also believe that um, my trousers were taken to the cleaner, and the cleaner sort of cleans the pocket. I mean, empties mm. the pockets before. And uh, so, according to you, this I should believe that P, right? At least according to one of the norm, because it's okay for me to, uh, I have a non-defective belief that uh, P, because I have good evidence that P, that I have a U in my evidence, pocket, yes. uh, and r relative to that particular uh, belief, then, that's okay, it shouldn't come into judging whether I should believe that P, whether I have some other belief which um, suggests that I shouldn't <laughs> believe yeah. that P. I don't know whether I make yeah, I, know, I, see, I, see, I see what you're saying. So that the, w whether on the account that I'm giving, you should believe P, it really just depends on whether it's possible for you in the non-deontic sense not to believe P, right? Because it, it, if it's possible for you, for, what, for, any, for whatever reason, not to believe P, then um, in, in that the world in which um, you you don't believe P, um, you're okay with P because you're I mean you, because you're vacuously okay with P, and yet you you don't um, sorry this is at the, yeah the, at the top of uh, the second page, uh, but you but you don't believe P, and so so that that that's an, uh, any any world in which. Uh, which is l locally possible, uh, um, I mean accessible if you like, uh, um, in which you don't believe P falsifies the claim that you should believe P. Right. So the, the only, b b and th th this is really coming uh, about because these, uh, these norms are just, just based on, on defectiveness of belief. I mean, there's not, the, the, they're not, yeah. But my, my point was, suppose you do Suppose you do believe P, but it, yeah, but it has to be that that not just that you do believe P, but that in in every locally possible world you believe P. Otherwise, you you don't count as uh, it doesn't count as being the case that that you should believe P. Okay, so it may be that in every possible. Uh, word I believe P, but I, it could also be that I have some other belief yeah. that all things considered should uh, um, induce me not to believe P, yeah. even if I don't realize that. Yeah, but the, the thing is, what, what, we're, what we're really dealing with here is just the fact that on these kind of modal accounts of, of should, um, anything which is necessary in the sense of being true in all the relevantly 
possible world automatically counts as obligatory. Right. Um, and you know, and so um, you know, it's just it's just. I mean, it's something that one will, un you know, unless we start playing with possible impossible worlds or something. It's you know, it we we will just automatically get that. Um, two plus two should be four, and that the, you know, if, if, and if assuming that all the, the possible worlds we're considering are physically possible, that, that you know, the law of gravity should hold, you know, and, and the, these will all come out as uh, obligatory um, for this kind of somewhat trivial re re reason that they, that they, that they're just, um, you know, a, a constant th throughout all, all these, these worlds, and and so th I mean that's that's a a kind of general um, oddity of deontic modal notions, and I, I think what we what we're seeing here is um, you know it, it's just that um, that we, we, you know we're getting a, a particular version of that point. So that, I mean, for example, suppose that, that, you know, suppose that in all relevantly possible worlds there is suffering, then we, we just automatically get on these, these modal deontic accounts that there, all, that there should be suffering. Um, and, um, you know, which is, of course, it's, you know, it, it's, it, it's not, it, it's not what we, um, expect, but it's it's something, and it's it's something which is kind of um, I mean, one can understand it also in terms of the duality between the, the should and the the may that um, because if you you know if there's just no possible world um, in in which there isn't suffering, then it's not in this sense it's not permissible for there not to be suffering. But, um, and I mean, I guess some people would would think at this point, well, then we all, we, we sh in this case we should consider a wider range of worlds or something like that. But um, okay, so, so, uh, just uh, the last question, and then I. So uh, would it be fair to say that uh, uh, then? there's a lot of weight in a sense on what the accessibility relation uh, for the model is. Uh, it, will, it, it, will definitely, it will definitely make a, a difference. Yeah. Because, I mean, in a sense for the, when we use the ontic models, we think about things like ideal worlds, right, in which yes. all the rules are respected and uh, things like that. And so, um, uh, then, of course, you don't get it in all the relevant world in which there is suffering. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, if there is suffering in all the relevant yes. world, there should be sufferings in the sense that the relevant worlds are not one, the ones in which uh, there is sufferings in all of them, right? Uh, and so, uh, the adequacy of defining should believe that P, in the way that you do, depends a lot on what accessibility relation you assume for, for the box. Yeah, but the accessibility relation is itself something that's given by context. Okay. Um, and, you know, and I think it's, I mean, and it is true of all sorts of, um, you know, ordinary deontic claims that, that we hold a lot fixed, which, um, You know, which has an effect. I mean, a series of which effect on which modal claims come out true, and uh, which uh, excludes, uh, which typically the restrictions exclude ideal worlds. So that, for example, you know, when when I tell somebody, um, you ought to apologise for being so rude. Um, the the ought. It requires um, that in all the the, the relevant worlds, the the person um, 
and all the relevantly good worlds, the person apologizes. But of course, it's only good for them to apologize given that they did something bad before. So, I mean, we're, typically we're holding the past fixed in these cases. We're, we're holding it fixed that, that they, they said this rude thing, and that's why they ought to uh, apologize. Um, and, I mean, of course, I mean, there are some uh, semantics uh, for models like Kratz's, which do things in a more complex way with, with rankings of, of worlds. Um, but but I, I'm, not I, I'm, I, I'm not convinced that that, that, that extra complexity is really um, a, appropriate, because I think with many, with many of these... Um, these uh, deontic notions, we're, we're, they're really binary things. I mean, they're, they're not, they're not, they don't go with rankings. They just go with, you know, uh, absolute <laughs> um, classifications. And, and, and really what's, what's doing the work is, is, not, is not a ranking of, of worlds, but, but simply as we're holding fixed the, the relevant class of, of, of worlds and, and then a, a binary classification with within that. So that, that's, that's the way that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of it. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, some questions, basic uh, questions, just to try to verify whether I understood properly and eventually perhaps a comment. Uh, I'm considering the norms uh, you mentioned uh, at the beginning of your handout. Yes. Which is the relation between uh, uh, the beliefs uh, and uh, the perspective of evaluating them as non-defective? Is it uh, the opposition between uh, a kind of an insider and an outsider? I mean, the one who believes uh, has his beliefs uh, and uh, somewhere else uh, uh, there are those uh, who are certifying whether there is uh, the possibility of uh, accessibility of the truth uh, or of an evidence uh, or any way of a knowledge. Is this the opposition? Yes, I mean, it, it, it doesn't have, to, I mean, it, it is, in a, a loose sense, it's, the, these are classifications to be made from a third personal point third of view. Person, yeah. um, I mean, it, it, it's not important for me whether the, as a, the really is an observer who can make these classifications. Uh -huh. I mean, that these are, as were, are, they're just, uh, if you like, in a way, objective classifications. Yeah. But, but, it, but, sure. um, they're. I mean, they're typically classifications that it's very, very difficult for. Uh, um, <laughs> people to apply well from a first personal point of view because, um, you know, of course it's in the nature of belief that, that, that we, we regard our own beliefs as true and, and mm -hmm. typically that we regard them as, mm -hmm. as based on good evidence and as knowledge and, and so on. And, um, and so it's, you know, but I mean that's, that's not so different from the, from even the case of classification of actions where, where you know, typically people believe that, that, that they've acted well and, sure, and so on sure, and, sure. Uh, and so this is, as, and so, so we're classifying the actions deontically in, or, or even functionally from an external point of view. Yes, so that's... Be, yeah, the, the so you uh, confirm that the perspective is that of the first person against a kind of a third person. Yeah, I mean, this, that's this, the yes, I mean, and this, relationship. It's sort of the third personal yeah. point of view that's being being applied in all, in all these classifications, both the functional ones and the the deontic modal ones. Yeah. Thanks. The second question, uh, just to understand, is uh, um, is uh, there the possibility of recognizing a certain similarity between this idea of belief and the idea of assent? I'm thinking of both Brentano and Frege. The idea that when you are developing a thought, you in a way accept it, give your assent to it, and then you pass to a kind of a claim yes. of an assertion 
And this doesn't uh, prevent uh, the, those who are listening to you to question about uh, the epistemic value of what you yeah. are saying while believing it and while asserting it? Can yes. this be, so, in a way, something near to that? Yes, it's, yes. And uh, I mean, specifically, I, I would say that um, assent and assertion are acts, whereas mm -hmm. belief is a state. But, but, sure. the, but uh, the assent may be, in effect, the, the act of coming to believe. <laughs> Thank you very much. The last uh, uh, question, which is uh, in a way kind of a comment, uh, is um, I have the impression that you always give uh, a propositional status to beliefs. I was uh, in London in Birkbeck a couple of months ago, and there was a workshop questioning propositionalism. So I was thinking about that because we have in natural languages the possibility of using the verb to believe without a clause after them, uh, but just saying I believe in, yes. especially in somebody. I believe in you and so on. And many natural languages accept this kind of a structure. So, uh, is there, on your behalf, the claim that every uh, f expression of that form can be converted into another uh, with a propositional form? Thanks. Um, so, n I think not necessarily. I mean, in some cases it can. So, uh, in, you know, if, if, if we say that um, somebody believes in Father Christmas, then, then maybe that is just equivalent to believing that Father Christmas exists. But, um, but when, but there's a, a maybe more interesting use of believing in somebody where um, it, it means some kind of, what we're talking about is some kind of trust. And so that, for example, you know, a, you know let's say the, the, and the coach of some athlete might, might tell them, look, I believe in you and uh, you can do it. And, um, and uh, you know, and so it, I mean, there are some relevant propositions, you know, but, but, um, but the, the trust seems like a more, dispositional uh, uh, attitude to the, the person. Um, and I think that the, these are not totally unrelated to propositional belief, because you know, one can think of propositional belief as, in some sense, trust in a proposition. Um, I think it's, it's much harder to to say what um, what norms would be appropriate to to belief in. I mean, I, it does seem like something for which some some normativity will be relevant. But but uh, um, the I mean, it's I mean, for example, you know, if you t well, the truth the truth norm doesn't doesn't apply in any in ob any obvious w way because it um, believing in somebody I mean that you can't classify a belief in somebody as true or false and um, and you and you can't and you can ask whether whether somebody knows somebody but of course that's completely different I mean the, I mean you can know somebody and and it may be because you know them that you don't believe in them but um, and so um, so I, I don't I don't want to dismiss th those other uses of belief but but I, I think it's it, it I, I think for for these purposes it's better to keep them separate because it, it the, don't seem to be good prospects of a, of a kind of unified theory that would, would cover uh, all of them. I mean, as I say, I think there are, you know, they have something in common with this notion of trust, but, but I, I don't think what they have in common is enough to produce a, a unified theory. So I, you know, I'm taking the case of propositional belief as a fairly natural kind and I mean, you know, maybe w w one day somebody will produce a more general theory of belief, but, but I, th I think this, this is enough to be getting on with. 
Maybe it, it would, this would be a good moment to, to take a five-minute yes, uh, break. Then and, uh, then we continue. And then, we, okay. and then uh, we can come back. And, well, and uh, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll go more briefly through the, the second half of the, All the right. paper. Thank you. I want to just to say that Relating this to some issues which have been quite widely discussed um, in um, the normative uh, theory, and in the and in particular on the on the debate uh, about uh, norms of belief, but but uh, in in also in meta ethics quite widely, and in particular about um, the the relation between uh, wide scope and uh, narrow scope norms. So, um, so what, what, what's meant uh, here is that, a, that often when we're stating a, a norm, we want to use both um, a deontic operator like um, may or should and also a conditional. And uh, and then the question is, should the, the conditional come inside the scope of the, the modal uh, operator or uh, outside? Um, and I mean, for example, uh, John Broom has argued that, that typically what, what we need are wide scope uh, norms. Um, and um, but uh, some people in the debate on norms uh, of belief think that the relevant norms are uh, need to, need to be narrow scope. Um, so uh, um, we can we can say something about about these norms, uh, the wide scope and narrow scope norms here on the basis of the account that we've already uh, developed. So the um, there's a very straightforward um, connection between the the account that I've given and wide scope principles of a particular kind, which, which just principles uh, of the kind that you know it should be that um, you you can that if you believe something, then it. it uh, you satisfy the condition for it to be non-defective. Uh, so the, the the truth norm gives you that if you it should be that if you believe p, then p is true. Uh, um, on the knowledge norm, it, it it should be that if you believe p, then you know p. And on the evidence norm, that it should be that if you believe p, then you believe it on uh, good evidence. Um, but but some people have complained that these na th these wide scope norms are not sufficiently uh, in, informative um, and, and that what we want is some kind of uh, narrow scope uh, principle which tells us uh, you know, a, a necessary and uh, sufficient uh, condition for uh, it being permissible to, uh, to believe P. Um, and, and so um, I've given, for example, the what the narrow scope principle would be for truth, which is that it's permissible to believe P uh, if and only if uh, P. Um, and a lot of the discussion has been about uh, problem cases for these uh, narrow scope uh, principles. I mean, discussion by uh, people like um, Hattie and Gardy and Big Fist and uh, Wedgwood and, and uh, a lot of others. Um, so I'll, I'll say something about the, uh, the problems with the, the narrow scope uh, principle. Um, so in the 
and, and particularly the truth, the truth principle. But you, you, although it, it's a bit more complicated with the, uh, the knowledge and uh, ev evidence standards, you get into similar kinds of difficulty uh, with them. Um, so there are some counterexamples to this narrow scope truth principle that, that, that you may believe P, if and only if P, in the, the right to left direction. So these, these are cases where um, it, it's true that P, but uh, where it's not true that, that you may believe P, it's, it seems. And, uh, and the, the standard sort of case of this are uh, more paradoxes, uh, things of the form, uh, for example, um, it's raining, but I don't believe that it's raining. Um, now, I mean, famously, more paradoxes are the propositions that um, can easily be true, but which um, can't be both true and believed by the relevant agent. Right. So or it, it can certainly be true that it's that it's raining. Uh, and yet I don't have the belief that it's raining, because, for example, it may be raining while I'm asleep in bed. Um, but um, it, if, if I um, believe a, a more paradoxical proposition, let's say I believe that it's um, raining and yet I don't believe that it's raining, so that's a, it's a belief. So it, this, the situation is one where I believe that um, I think I was using Q for this, for the Q, and I I don't believe Q. Um, since I since I believe this conjunction, I presumably I believe the first conjunct. So I I believe um, Q. And, and that means that the more sentence of this conjunction, uh, the more proposition, is false. Right? So, so although it can be true, it can't be both true and believed by me. Um, and, and so it seems that it, it, it's, it's not permissible for me, it, even in a situation where the more, par, more proposition is true, it's not permissible for me to believe it, because if I were to believe it, it wouldn't be true. Right. Um, and, and so that's, that seems like a, you know, a, one good kind of objection to the, the, the narrow scope uh, truth principle. And people have started um, putting in exception clauses and so on to deal with these uh, cases. Um, there also seem to be Counterexamples in going from um, from left to right cases in in which it's uh, permissible to believe something, even though in the situation in which it's permissible to believe it, the proposition isn't true. Um, so th these are slightly well, they're complicated cases in a slightly different case. So um, so just w w what we need to think concentrate on are. Um, two situations. The, f the first situation um, is one in which um, I, uh, I never blush and I never even consider my blushing. Um, and situation two is um, one where I'm blushing and, uh, and I know that I'm blushing. Um, and maybe, you know, it, I'm thinking of a, a case where um, as soon as I even think about whether I'm blushing, I start, I'm start blushing, and and so that, uh, and then I realise that I'm blushing, and because you get that kind of hot feeling in your cheeks, and and so on, and uh, so, so that as we even even considering the possibility of blushing would um, would take me from such as it were a potential situation one to situation two, and um, and I'm assuming that situation. Uh, two is possible in this the local sense of diamond from the standpoint of situation one, and um, 
And we'll take as the relevant proposition P, that the proposition that I sometimes blush. So in, in situation two, um, I, I have a, a non-defective belief in P, because I, in, in situation two, I believe that I'm blushing, and uh, that belief satisfies all these criteria. Um, it's true, I, it's a, something I know, and it's something that I have um, good evidence uh, I believe it on good evidence for. Um, and, and so it should be the case that since, since situation two is so easily accessible from situation one, it should be accessible in the sense of the, the, this local um, modality diamond from situation one. So it should be that in situation one, it's possible, in the sense of diamond, that, that I have a non-defective belief in P. And that means, because, it, because in, in situation two, I do have a non-defective belief, and so it's in situation one, it's possible for me in the relevant sense. And, um, and so in... Um, in situation one, I may believe P, I mean, it's permissible for me to believe P, even though P is false in situation one. It's P is false and I don't believe P, but, but there's, a, as it were, a, a, an accessible situation in which it's true and I do uh, believe it. Um, so, for a suitable accessibility relation, um, the, that we, we get this kind of, um, of breakdown um, because you know, we, we can, you know, in situation two, it's, uh, that, it, that will count as relevant from the point of, from the, um, in relation to situation one. Um, I mean, of course, you, you could have some even more um, local uh, modality, uh, which w w such that situation two didn't even count as relevant. But as soon as situation two uh, counts as uh, as relevant, it looks as though we're going to get this this problem um, on the on the left to right direction, where. Um, the permissibility, e e as well, even if we start off with a, a, a truth as a standard of non-defectiveness, it's permissible to believe things which are n narrow scope. It's permissible to believe things which are not in the situation in which it's permissible true, because in the situation in which you do believe them, they are true, um, and and so we we get these. Um, these kind of uh, of problems, um, b because of the this modal dimension um, in um, in the deontic notions of permissibility and uh, obligation, um, and I mean the thing is. You know, in a sense, we we can give narrow scope principles, but in order to give them, we we have to use uh, context-sensitive notions like these non-deontic modalities, diamond and and box. So, I mean, if you just if you look at the um, the top of the second page of the handout, uh, you'll see that, in effect, I'm, I'm giving uh, the condition um, for um, the, the may and the sh may believe and should believe. I mean, it, I've, I've given them in, well, for the may believe, which is the more interesting case, 
Um, I've given it in terms of S has a non-defective belief in P, but then depending on whether you, you, you think the relevant norm should be a truth norm or an evidence norm or a knowledge norm, you can, you can cash out the non-defective belief, you know, either as a true belief or, in, uh, a piece of, or, in, or knowledge or as b uh, belief based on good evidence. So it, in a way, it, it, it's not that it's impossible to, uh, to have a a narrow scope principle for the permissibility of belief and, um, and obligatoriness of belief. Um, it's, it's just that in order to do it, you have to take um, explicit account of uh, the context dependence of the relevant modal notions. Uh, the and that, and I think what people have been doing is that they've been trying to get, in effect, to, um, to get some explicit equivalent of the, um, the effective context by in, um, trying to uh, so we'll modulate these uh, narrow scope principles to, to, uh, to get round the kind of difficulties that we saw, both with the more paradox case and the blushing case. But, but that's not really the, the right uh, response because uh, it, it, it just tries to, to calculate these things on the basis of the, uh, the particular proposition at, at issue. But the, the context, uh, of course, is going to be sensitive to all sorts of other things that happen to have been mentioned. And as we, you know, as, as we saw in the case of the uh, the example with the watch about whether it's permissible for you to take the take the watch and leave the room that um, that can just depend uh, well that can also just depend on um, w w well it, as we're speaking from the point of view of the actual world it, it depends on whether whether situations in which I give you the watch are being uh, whether those kind of possibilities are considered as relevant or not and um, and so it's, it's just not going to, to work to try to state a narrow scope principle in a context independent terms um, because we'd, we'd in effect be trying to give a, you know, a context independent equivalent of something that d does, depends on context. And um, that is not going to have a happy ending. Um, so, you know, I, th I think people have have been looking at the ki wrong kind of issues, um, misled by the the consequences of thinking of these uh, norms in modal terms, and and really what I've been arguing is that the. Or, or the as well, the context sensitivity and the trickiness of the modal dimension is, is not fundamentally part of the, the, the normative dis distinctions we should be worrying about. Because you know, w w when, when it comes to just thinking about uh, what, what is a defective belief and what isn't, these issues don't arise. These are the, the issues that we're talking about, they all have to do with um, questions of what you, how you deal with situations uh, in which nobody or the relevant subject does not have the belief, but we want to talk about whether it's permissible for, for them to have it. And that's where the modality is coming in. Um, and, you know, I mean, we can, we can deal with that, but, the, but the, the, in order to capture the, uh, the ordinary judgments, we'll have to deal with it in a context-sensitive way. But, but the really interesting issue is, you know, something at the initial uh, functional level. I mean, like, as well, what counts as a, a non-defective belief? Um, and as well, that's where we should be directing our energy and, the, and just extending it to this uh, the modal dimension. It, it, it can be done, but in order to do it, we have to, to introduce somewhat extraneous factors which uh, which are not really going to be very revealing about the, the, the pr primary matters of interest. Okay, so let's, let's have some uh, discussion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much.
much. Uh, two questions. The first one regards the title. I'm wondering which is the proper meaning of function in your uh, choice uh, yes. uh, of the title. And the second uh, question is uh, mm, always uh, about uh, the idea of belief, the concept of belief. I am tempted, in a way, to interpret it uh, in uh, the uh, counterexamples in the narrow scope uh, truth principle as a kind uh, of awareness. Well, not just yes. the kind of belief when I have no epistemic uh, proper accessibility to something, but I believe that something is true for some kinds of reasons. So I think it's not just the same belief. Am I wrong? Well, I, I would say, say that awareness is, um, is more like knowledge than like belief. Um, and, and so, um, I mean, in, in a way, we, if once we classify something as awareness and therefore as a kind of knowledge, we, we've already sort of said, uh, on, at least on most views, that it has a good normative uh, status. Uh, so, so the, that in, in talking of belief, part of the, the, the point is, uh, as it were, to have a classification where we don't, I mean, the, the, the term belief is neutral between beliefs that have a good normative status and beliefs uh, that don't. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I, this, this is meant to be an account that applies to, uh, as it were, even the, the most disreputable beliefs, I mean, the beliefs that, that somebody c comes to in some completely irrational way. They, I mean, they, they're, they're still being judged. Uh, according to the normative uh, status. And um, so that, that's just on the way I'm thinking about belief. I mean, I'll say, I'll say more about the notion of belief tomorrow and on, on Thursday. But uh, it's... Um, I mean, they're all, all these cases of... Uh, well, on my view, the, these cases they, they, of belief, they, they may all, as it were... <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> they may all feel like <coughs> knowledge from the inside. <laughs> or, I mean, there may also be cases. I mean, there may be a few cases where, which, where even the the subject doesn't regard it as knowledge. I mean, maybe people who, you know, who, um, who some people who have religious faith may, you know, they they may. They may not regard their their belief that God exists as as knowledge. Maybe some of them. I mean, this is not such a traditional way of being re religious, but, but some of them maybe regard it as a leap of faith which they're making without knowledge. But so it so it may you know it, there, there are probably cases where you can you can believe something and yet um, and and yet not b believe that you know it. But but I think the normal case is where you, you as well as for humans anyway as, as well as when you believe something, you also believe that you, that you know it. Um, on the question of uh, function, so I'm, I'm being a bit cagey here, but, um, but I'm thinking of this as, uh, uh, in some broad sense, you know, similar to you know, the, the, the function of the heart is to pump blood and, and that kind of thing. That, that, that as were, this, the, the, these are claims about what, what beliefs are, are for in some way. Um, and, that, uh, and then according to your view, they're, they're, um, they're to, the point of a belief is to be true or to be based on evidence or to, to, be, uh, to be knowledge. Um, I'm, I mean, of course, there's a, there's a whole literature on how the notion of function is, um, is analysed. And, um, you know, I want, I, I want to, be, to be fairly cautious on, on that because, uh, you know, I mean, some, some accounts, of course, want to make it a, a, a matter of evolution and, and, and maybe that is... That's true in uh, the case of, of humans and other animals. On the other hand, you know, I, I don't want to exclude 
the possibility of artificial intelligence where maybe, you know, the, the, the art, uh, artifacts, robots or something, uh, if they're sufficiently sophisticated, perhaps can have beliefs and th those beliefs will, um, their function w won't, won't be the product of, of evolution in the same sense, but, but nevertheless, uh, you know, it's still, it, it, I mean, the functional talk still seems to make sense, you know, even whenever we're talking about a robot, that it's, its beliefs ha uh, have, a, have a certain uh, function. Um, so, the, yeah, the, that's the first answer to you. Um, thanks. I, I'm still not clear on the treatment you gave um, toward the end of uh, um, the narrow scope principles. Um, um, so I hope this will not be too confused as a question. But so I thought that in the debate and whether uh, rationality principles and things like that are narrow scope or wide scope. One key element was that um, um, the question whether they are narrow scope or wide scope uh, bears on what kind of conclusions you can draw from certain reasonings. So um, I don't know if I, um, if I have, a, say, um, um, a wide scope principle of the form uh, uh, should be the case that um, if I believe I was born in Milan, then I believe um, I was born in Italy, I believe I was born in Milan, then I cannot extract the conclusion that uh, it ought to be the case that I ought to, to believe that um, I was born in Italy. Yeah. Whereas if, if, if it's narrow, um, if it's narrow scope, of course, I can, um, I can um, draw the conclusion. Yeah. Um, and, but uh, you, you introduced, uh, and, and uh, of course, similar examples might be applied to um, um, knowledge norms for belief. Um, okay. Um, but the, the way you introduce the, 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 the discussion on whether it's a narrow scope or wide scope, um, it had to do with um, um, the possibility of giving uh, sufficient, uh, necessary and sufficient conditions for believing something and with context uh, dependence or context independence application of certain principles. And I, I was not clear um, whether uh, what you said is related to um, uh, this other set of issues which, which I was mentioning, is it, if, if that's yeah. if that makes sense, okay. Yeah, so, okay. Um, so it's, it's true that the, the connection with, with some of the, the issues about rationality is not, is not so direct, but um, so, the, so let's just to go over the kind of case that you were um, talking about, let's t take the case where P entails Q, and then the, the, um, the narrow scope principle is that um, if you believe P, then you ought uh, right. to believe Q, and the wide scope principle uh, is that if you ought, it ought to be that if you believe P, then you believe Q. Right. Um, and the so that I mean the, the I mean the powerful thing about the narrow scope uh, principle is that just from the fact that you do believe P, it you know it gives you an ought. Whereas even with the, the wide scope one, it, it, even if you I mean assuming that the logic of of ought is um, what's called normal, I mean you can distribute and then you can get that if you ought to believe P, then you ought to believe Q. But, but you don't get, as it were, something that, that um, takes you from the fact that you actually have a belief. To, and, um, but, I mean, one great advantage of the, um, the wide scope, norm is that it, it avoids a bad uh, feature of the, um, the narrow scope principle, which is that you get a kind of um, 
belief laundering, where, where you, I mean, and, and you know, a trivial case of this, but which is already really bad, is that if we just take the case where, where P equals Q, uh, we get that if you believe P, then you ought to believe P. And, uh, and so it seems, that, as it were, whatever you in fact believe is something that you're obliged to believe. And, you know, and of course, that, that seems quite wrong because P might be some crazy uh, belief. Um, so I think that although the, the, the connections are, are, are not absolutely direct, there is, there is something um, similar going, going on in the, the problems with the narrow scope uh, principles in both cases. Um, because what we're doing is we're comparing across different possible situations, right? Um, and, um, and so we've got the, we've, here we've got the situation where you do believe P, and, and, and then we're, as we're, in some way, we're um, deontically relating that to uh, other situations in which um, uh, it, you're supposed to believe Q, I mean, the, or, or the, 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 the situations you ought to be in. Um, whereas in this case, um, I mean, and for example, it's not even, it's not even given here that, 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 yeah, that, uh, that you believe Q in these, these other situations. Whereas w w when, when there's a, a wide scope principle, um, we're, we're just, uh, uh, in effect, looking at um, the, the, the combination within a, within a single world of, you know, is, is there a world in which it's, okay, you know, an okay world where you believe P and you don't believe Q? Um, and, um, and so the, I mean, the, the, the same kind of thing is tending to go wrong um, with these, um, with these situations, with, with, sorry, with these oh, na narrow scope uh, principles, um, which, which is that um, it, there's a, an unclarity about what, what to hold constant, right? I mean, it's because it's not clear wh whether the, um, the belief that P should be held constant when you go from the world that you're actually in to the worlds that you ought to be in, and whether those uh, are, those are still uh, uh, worlds, uh, as were the deontically accessible worlds, whether they're the same as the, the world that you're in with respect to belief in P. And um, so, so there, that's where we're getting the trouble from here. And, and then in the, the kind of objections that I was making to the, um, to the narrow scope uh, principles uh, for the norm of, of belief, um, they, they were cases which involved um, Varying some of the the facts, um, or well, actually, in, in the in the blushing case, we, we were we were varying facts about whether I'm blushing and so on. In the uh, in the more paradox case, we were the, well va varying whether I believed that it was raining. Also va varied the truth value of the the m more paradoxical proposition. Um, so. So you, 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 you get, you, with these narrow scope principles, you, you, you get caught up in a tricky issues about what's to be held fixed and, and what you're allowing to vary as you go uh, to the, these different uh, accessible worlds. Um, and, uh, and that's, and of course, that's, it, it's typical of um, natural language that, that, that what, what is held fixed, you know, from, from purposes of modal discourse is very, very sensitive to the, the context. And so we, we get tangled up in a whole of, lot of issues of that kind. Um, and and the, the, it's the, the, um, the wide scope principles that uh, allow us just to finesse those by, um, 
by just looking at whether we've got the connections that we want within, within as it were, one world at a, at a time. So, um, so uh, you know, it, I think they're similar kinds of issues, but in, in the rationality case, we're, we're, we're typically we're concerned with issues of internal coherence amongst beliefs, whereas in the, the norms of belief literature, we're concerned with connections between belief and the, and the world or, 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 well, I guess with the evidence norm, it, it might be more like, more like an internal coherence norm, at least on the view of evidence that people who like such a norm tend to, to have. So the, the, the evidential norm might, be the, might work m most similarly to the, the rationality cases. So suppose that I, um, I believe that tomorrow will rain because I performed the rain dance. Okay. And uh, suppose that I'm also convinced that if I didn't perform the rain dance, then the current meteorological conditions would have been responsible for whether it will rain or not. Uh, but uh, if I perform the rain dance, the meteorological conditions have no... Um, current meteorological conditions have no bearing on whether it will rain tomorrow or not. What really causes yeah. the, the rain is um, uh, the rain dance. And I believe that tomorrow it will rain because I, I did the rain dance. seems to me that my belief is defective in that case, um, that tomorrow yes. will rain is defective. However, from the point of view of that situation, it's sort of conceivable a situation in which I believe that it will rain um, because of the current meteorological condition. Um, and so it is permissible for me to believe that it's raining. So if, so this, this, is, a, this is a case, um, I, are you thinking this is a kind of case where, where you, roughly speaking you have um, propositional but not doxastic justification. I mean, that, that, you, that you're believing on a bad basis, but there is a good basis available to you to believe. Or um. There is a good basis, but I don't think... I mean, the, the way I was thinking of the example, because you have this idea that I could have a defective belief yes. that P, and at the same time have a non-defective belief yes. that P. Uh, and so if I think that the meteorological conditions also determine whether it will rain or not, then I would also have a non-defective belief that, yes. that it will rain tomorrow. Yes. But the, the way I'm trying to think of the case is such that um, uh, I really do only a defective belief, because yes. have a defective belief because I think that it's the rain dance that determines yes. the yes. rain. So and so, but... At the same time, I want to say it's accessible. The, the situation in which it rains because of the meteorological condition is accessible from the point of view of the situation that I'm describing. Yes. Because after all, if I don't perform the rain dance, meteorological condition will determine whether it will rain or not. Yes. And so I th you would predict that then it is permissible for me to believe that, that it will rain tomorrow, but I'm not sure that in a case like this, um, it should be permissible for me to... So, I see. So it will, it, I mean, it, whether it comes out as... So this is a case where in the actual situation, you have only a defective belief in P, but there's a, an accessible situation where you have a non-defective belief in, in P. Um, so this, this is going to, depend on, on which worlds count as relevant for, for the, uh, um, and for the, uh, for the purposes of the, for the, of the, the diamond. Um, so, 
so one thing that may be going on is that you know in cases where somebody um, is where we are aware that somebody has a certain belief um, then we tend what we tend we may tend to do is to um, is to hold hold it const hold their belief situation constant since they already have the belief and and so the, so in some in some conversational contexts it may be that the only worlds that we consider relevant are the ones where the the person has the the belief in the same sort of way that they have it in the actual world and and then if if that's so then um, the the belief may well come out as impermissible given that it's a it's defective in this world and may may be for similar reasons defective in all the the neighboring worlds but but we can also think of conversational situations where the, we, we want to hold a um, a wider variety of before you go on to consider before we go on to consider the second situation l l let's stay for a second on on the first one yes. suppose that the belief of the subject is constant in the two situations that they described however in the second situation he doesn't perform the rain dance so so then for, he, for so him, meteorological think. conditions become uh, what determines the, 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 uh, yeah. uh, the, whether it will rain or not. And, so, uh, and since they are such that uh, they predict that yes. it will rain, then, then he believes that it will rain. So yeah. but, but the thing is, in the second situation, what's constant is his belief that, that as well, the, the rain that if you do, if you do the rain dance that will trump the meteorological conditions but but other beliefs of his are changing right because uh, his in this in the second situation he he doesn't have the the belief that he performed the rain dance and and therefore his belief that it will rain uh, has a has a different basis from the one that it has in the actual world um, because uh, it, it, it's in, in that other situation it the belief is based on the meteorological conditions so there I mean there are all sorts of doxastic um, differences between the the world uh, even though some as it were some of his more um, general beliefs are, are constant between them and and so you know I think there, there will be there will be conversational contexts in which only worlds in which he comes to believe in exactly the same way uh, as in the actual world count as accessible and and so those will, will all be ones where he believes uh, that it will rain because he um, performs the rain dance and and then has a standing belief that if he performs the rain dance it will rain or something and um, okay uh, but in the in the situation one and situation two you discuss in the current examples to the narrow scope truth principle there is also change of belief there right because in situation one he doesn't believe that he's blushing and in situation two he does believe that he's yes. blushing so so the, i mean the, so the, these these the kinds of cases that i'm i'm giving um here they whether their counterexamples depends on um, the conversational situation, right? So, so, so that, um, so that, yes. I mean, you, you, you're. You, I, I mean, I, I agree that, that um, it won't be in all com conversational contexts that situation two is uh, is possible from the, from the standpoint of situation one. It's just that there will be quite a few in which it is, and so in, it, it, the principle will fail in, in those. So that's, yeah, that's something that I should have brought out, that, that the failure of these principles, um, I mean, I, there's a question mark, which is partly um, a warning about that. The, um, it, it depends on, uh, on what the con conversational context uh, is. Um, so just, just to give an example, of the of, of a, a conversational context where um, we're considering a wider range of worlds so um, 
So suppose that, that from the outside, we are, um, let's say, aware that that this, maybe this guy, has, he's, listen, he's listened to the weather forecast. He knows what the weather forecast is. It's just that he doesn't regard it as relevant anymore because he's performed the rain dance. So, um, the, the, but, 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 he, but we know that he has, he has heard the weather forecast, and let's suppose that uh, it's common knowledge that the w weather forecast in this uh, country is, uh, is very reliable and so on. And so, so then... Uh, we, we may not even know w what he believes about the um, about the, the weather, but but we we might make the the judgment then that it that it's permissible for him to believe that it will rain because because we're, we're, we're basing that just on on our knowledge that he does in fact have adequate evidence at his disposal to to form a non-defective belief that it will rain, um, and so so the so there will be conversational contexts in which. It's, it's fine to say that it's, that it's permissible for him to reign. Um, w w ones where we're, w we're not holding fixed the facts about uh, how he has come to any belief that he may actually have about, um, about whether it will reign. Uh, so I, th you know, I think that the both kinds of context are, p are possible. Okay. So you would say that in intuitively in the context in which we look at the way he uh, arrived to the belief, then there we would be um, inclined to say that, that, uh, that that's not permissible. Yeah, if I think, if, if we're holding fixed the exact way in which he's reached the belief, then we'll, then we'll say it's not permissible because as it were, uh, and let's let's assume that it's not a case where he has the same belief for two <laughs> in two different ways. And we're, so, well, in fact, let's have, so we're, we're holding that fixed as well. That, so that we're just that, we, that his dis doxastic relation to this proposition is exactly the same as in the actual world. Uh, so we're holding all, all those key f things fixed. Then I think the judgment will be it's it's not permissible for him to believe it because because we're we're thinking of him as believing it in, in this bad way. But, but then in other um, contexts, we, we, we won't be fixing on the exact way in which he, you know, the exact doxastic relation that he does stand to, it, to the proposition. We'll just be focusing on the fact that, that a good basis for belief is available to him. And in those contexts, it seems correct to, to judge that, that it's permissible for him to believe the proposition. I mean, th th those seem to me reasonable results to, to get. I, I may have a follow-up on this, uh, on the last counterexample, because in situation one, as I understand it, is a situation where I never blush, uh, and I never consider my blushing. Yeah. So it is not, I don't have any attitude towards my blushing. And uh, it is not clear to me that in this situation, there is a conversational uh, standard which allows for to consider that, I sent, that it is possible uh, that I have a non-defective belief that I sometimes blush. First of all, because what I have to change is to change my attitude and to change my physical reactions. Or, and it seems to me too much to be changed. I mean, uh, this kind of possibility seems to be a metaphysical possibility, but not an epistemic possibility. Um. And, for, so, for situation one. I so in situation, oh. in situation one, it's meant to be a, just a situation in which, you know, uh, I just in fact never blush, in this, at least in this situation. And not, beca not because I have any special disposition not to blush, but, just, but, but nothing happens to, to make me blush. Right. 
And then the idea is in situation two, situation two may start like situation uh, one, mm -hmm. but, um, but supposing, um, suppose in situation two, it could be, for example, that um, just th that somebody uh, says to me, um, I'm, uh, somebody maliciously says, look, you're blushing <laughs> and, uh, or maybe just, are you blushing or something? And then, and then that makes me all self-conscious. And so I start blushing and then I, you know, and I'm aware of blushing. And so, so that the, as we're accessing, I mean, of course, these are incompatible situations. So you can't, it can't be that, that, that you're in, in both of them. Um, but, but you could, uh, from the point of view of, um, of somebody who's, as it were, in, initially in situation uh, one, you, you can you can get into um, into situation two. So that, for example, um, in the you know situation situation one could be. Um, a situation where I, I never put my foot on that table. Mm. And situation two could be, you know, a situation, I'm, I'm going to avoid putting my foot on, but I, you know, a situation where, I'd, um, where, where I'd, I do put my um, foot on that table. And so, um, you know, we, I mean, we want to say that, that various um, counterfactual situations are nevertheless possible. And, uh, and so, um, and of course, the situation that's counterfactual is incompatible with the, the, the full history of the, of the situation um, from, from which it's, it, it's counterfactual. But, um, but I'm, not, I'm not seeing that, that the, the difference between, I mean, Situation one and situation two is more problematic than those kind of cases. Well, my opinion is that, of course, they, they are metaphysically, one is metaphysically possible with respect to the other. But as long as it seems to me that you are trying to grasp an epistemic um, uh, possibility or something which goes within the epistemic possibility, the the situation in which I never blush and I never consider my blushing, uh, well, it is difficult to say how it is epistemic accessible yeah. uh, situation to, well, I, I agree that it is metaphysically possible in the sense it is counterfactually possible that yeah. uh, I'm blushing instead and that I consider whether I blush or not. But is it epistemically possible? Well, really? but I don't think it, I don't think these situations. I mean, these these modal operators. These are these are meant to be as were, objective rather than epistemic uh, um, modal operators, mm -hmm. and um, and so I, you know, I don't I don't think that these. Uh, alternative possibilities need to be epistemically possible for you. Um, because, you know, supposing it's a situation where um, I, I could, I could believe Q because I could, uh, I mean Q, not the same Q, but just any old proposition. I could believe Q because um, it would be permissible for me to believe Q because I could, let's say, I could de deduce Q from things that I know. But suppose in the, and so it's a situation in which uh, it may be uh, permissible for me to believe Q. But I might, in, in the actual situation, I might not draw these consequences and I might be aware that, uh, that I ha simply haven't settled um, Q. I mean, so, you know, Q could be some, like some matter of, you know, a, a long,
some little mathematical problem which I haven't solved, but if I, you know, if I put my mind to it, I could quite easily solve it, but I haven't solved it. And so I'm, I'm aware that, I, so I know that I don't have a, a belief in Q. But um, there's an accessible world which I could get to just by doing the relevant calculations in which I do believe Q. But, but I know I'm not in that world because... Uh, um, because I, I know that I, I, I have no belief for or against Q. So that would be a case where it's, this world, it's, 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 it's possible for me to, to believe Q. And in fact, it, let's say it's possible for me to know Q because, because all that's required is that I do, I do a certain calculation. So it's objectively possible for me to get into that situation because it, this calculation is within my capacity and so on. But in the situation I'm actually in, I don't do the calculation, and I know that I, I'm agnostic about Q. And so, so, so I know that, I, that I'm not in, in, this, not, a, not in a possible situation where I believe Q. So, you know, I think it's... Uh, it, for, for this apparatus to work the way that it should, I, th I think we've got to allow that, that these uh, possibilities uh, can be ones that... Uh, and although they're objectively possible and maybe quite very easily possible, they're, they're not epistemically possible. All right, thank you. Um, I would like to, maybe this is in part uh, when you were, um, you know, replying to Sandro's question. Um, Maybe this is related to that, but I'd like to think a little more about uh, the conception of norm that you have here. Um, so the first thing I was thinking, uh, the first question is a clarification question I have is this. Um, so the, the norms, these epistemic norms that, <clears throat> if I understand, are supposed to be spelled out by, by the quantifiers, right? Um, so by the possible words over which, uh, over which the, the quantifiers range. Yeah, but, but um, the, the initial normative distinction is the defective, non-defective one, which yeah. doesn't depend on possible worlds. It just, yes. it, you know, it, it's more basic than that. And then the, the, these, the, these modal operators are just being used to e extend the initial defectiveness, non-defectiveness classification into... Um, a sort of deontic modal classification. Yes, um, and we we started, you know, by assuming the defective non-defective distinction because, of yes. course, otherwise. Um, so what I was uh, wondering is, in the interpretation, you know, of uh, of the words where the quantifiers are supposed to range, um, can the agent who has the belief, can the agent have uh, some beliefs about that? Yeah, in principle. Well, I mean, wh why not? I mean, of course, well, uh, just to be clear, the, we, we've got, we need to distinguish, on the one hand, the situation of the agent themselves, uh, and on the other hand, the, the conversational context in which we're talking about the normative status of that agent's beliefs, and and so the um, the range of these quantif quantifiers over worlds um, that depends on the the conversational context of the people who are assessing the beliefs. It doesn't depend on whatever situation the uh, the agent themselves is in, uh, unless, of course, it, we're talking about a situation in which the agent is assessing their own beliefs. I mean, the, we could, there's that special case, but, but the first personal case. But, um, but the more general case is one where we, are, let's say, we are talking about the, um, the, the normative status of someone else's beliefs, or maybe the normative status of our own past beliefs or something like that. No, no, because I was wondering the discussion because before with Sandro, much of the reply depends on uh, how we decide to set the context of the interpretation, right? The, the context of in which the, 
this uh, the person is having a belief, right? Yes. And I was wondering if, if maybe in the example you could add that the agent not only has a belief about uh, um, whether you know the dance is effective, but may also have a belief about which words are uh, epistemically accessible, so to speak, right? And I was just thinking whether you would like that uh, that type of uh, addition, you know, to the. Yeah. Um, well, I, I mean, I think that the, the the person that we were describing probably does have. I mean. I mean, having beliefs about which worlds are epistemically accessible is, is really, to you, it's, it's basically just having beliefs about what you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and so um, he, he may well have beliefs about what he knows. He may well believe that he knows that if he performs the rain dance it will rain, properly, it will rain. <laughs> um, so um, so he, c he can have... Um, beliefs which in effect are about epistemic possibilities for him. I mean, what, about what is and what is not epistemically possible for him. But um, there's no automatic transfer of, the, as it were, the, his epistemic accessibility relation to our alethic accessibility relation for the diamond and the box. I mean, that's, okay. as it were, it's, it's up to us, the, the participants in whatever conversation it is, you know, w w what our r r range of contextually relevant alethic possibilities uh, is. And, um, and after all, you know, that, that may be changing rapidly as the different possibilities are raised in the, in our conversation, while um, nothing is changing in the agent th themselves of, of relevance. But of course, so this is what I expected you to say. I think this clarifies, thank you. And so the, the other thing I had was, uh, so when, uh, in part you, you were mentioning this before, uh, you know, in a question before, uh, in the first part of the, of the talk. So these norms are not norms of beliefs uh, about uh, all sorts of beliefs, right? So we're uh, supposed to also address beliefs uh, about maybe aesthetic judgments or whether something is funny, you know, or uh, whether yeah. something. Um, so in, in, in some of those cases, it seems that uh, individuating the, the relevant words is a bit more of a tricky business, right? I mean, in, and in part, in the example you were giving before, instead of the promise of the watch you know, that you were giving me before in the answer, in the question asked uh, in the first part, there was built inside, of course, the fact that uh, in, uh, in finding the words, we have to find the right words where certain norms, you know, hold. Um, so what I'm just thinking is uh, um, what happens when uh, maybe some of those beliefs, you know, about things that are somewhat indeterminate, right? Like being funny or being fuzzy somewhat. It's, it's really hard, I think, to come up with the list of words, right? So um, how precise do you want this, uh, you know, this machinery to be? This is... Uh, um, well, of course, I, I think... I mean, there's, I think there's, even when the subject matter of the beliefs is maybe something quite precise, I think the, the, the range of, the, of worlds that we're considering in the conversation may be, may be vague. Mm -hmm. And, and a fortiori, in, in the case where um, the, the, the subject matter of the beliefs is also something very vague. So, so I, I want to leave a lot of room for vagueness. Of course, you know, I'm an epistemicist about vagueness, so I think, in fact, uh, all of this will be completely classical and there will, in fact, be uh, sharp boundaries, but we just don't know where they are and so on. So, so of course, I will, be, I will be giving an epistemicist treatment of vagueness. Um, but, but, I want, but still al allowing for vagueness. I don't, I don't think that what I, I've been saying particularly depends on an epistemicist theory of vagueness. I mean, I, um, I think that you know, if somebody wanted to, for example, to have a, a, a supervaluationist theory of vagueness, I, I think that, that they could take over pretty much everything that I've been, been saying today with, within their account of vagueness.
mm. and, and maybe even with, with a, a fuzzy logical approach, although I think a lot of, a, a lot of these things are going to work in very funny ways with, with fuzzy logic, but that's its problem. Okay, so, and this is the, the last thing then, uh, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, in what way, so this is a, if I understand it, I don't know if you would agree with the contextualist account of, uh, of norms, you know, of, of the Well, it, not, yeah, not, of, not of the initial norms, no. but it's a, it's a contextualist account of the, um, of the deontic uh, yeah. modalities, um, it, in this, because it's contextualist about the range of, of worlds, and you know, and I think there's just independent reason for thinking that we have to be uh, um, contextualist about that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, and uh, and so you, you know, what was uh, what I was thinking in that indeed in in that respect is uh, uh, well, first of all, I'm very sympathetic you know, to to these uh, to these movies. Uh, perhaps is uh, is um, uh, it might be slightly unusual, you know, to find it here. But one thing. Um, that uh, that I was thinking is uh, um, whether the um, how should I put it um, um, shoot I'm sorry I lost um, um, can I just respond to, yeah, to yeah, one yeah, thing sure. you said with, about whether this is unusual I mean it, th this kind of Context dependence of modal talk is is something that is um, part and parcel of, for example, Kratz's uh, semantics uh -huh. for for modals. Yeah. So that you know, it, just in so far, it, just the presence of context sensitivity in you know with with modals. That I don't. I wouldn't. I would say that's not an unusual move. I would think of that as more an uh, actually an orthodox. No, yeah, in, the, in that sense, I understand. So here, you know, what um, you know, came back to my mind, what, what I was thinking is that uh, the, uh, what I find uh, the, of the normative constraint here is that, uh, um, if I understand, so the, the agent does not have, uh, uh, you know, a certain kind of authority, so to speak, over, uh, over the normative constraints. Yes. Right? So the norms that we're talking about here are not, uh, so to speak, uh, I mean, agential norms in the sense that they're not made by agents, right? And by no particular agent, they're not uh, spelled out by any particular agent, right? So they are somehow derivative on the meaning of what the agents are believing. And, and that meaning is not fixed by uh, the agents. Is that well, I mean, something? The, 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 I mean, w what... What propositions the agent is expressing by their words, they're assuming that they are verbalizing propositions. I mean, that's, that depends on the, the meanings of the agent's word, words. It doesn't yeah. depend on the, the, uh, the words used by us as, as theorists. Um, of course, uh, I mean, you know, my own view would be that the appropriate theory of the content of, of the um, the agent's utterances will be a, a semantic externalist one, but still that would just have to do with the agent's community. We, may not, we might not even belong to the agent's community. So that, that in, in principle, the, this is, this, I mean, of course, you, I mean, it could be, if, if, you, if you were being contextualist about the, no, the, the, the meaning of the word belief, that then, that then that could make a difference. Yeah. But, um, but I, oh, I have not been arguing for that kind of contextualism here. It's, it's, uh, the only contextualism that I've actually been invoking is the, the contextualism for these, these modal operators. Yeah, so which is what is inside, so to speak, they believe, what the beliefs are about. I don't know how to put what, it. What they're about. That, yeah, that's yeah. A, as far as anything yeah. I've said here goes, that, that's up to the agent, not up to yeah. us. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Alif. So, uh, we thank our speaker again. <laughs> See you tomorrow.